absolutely a happy Thursday. I'm gonna do one, I'm sending out one quick uh, post and then we'll go ahead and get started, everyone. There we go. Awesome, hello, hello, uh, happy Thursday, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Rivera, I'm the team leader for Keller Williams South East Los Angeles for the guests uh, that we have on today. A couple housekeeping items that I just wanna share really quickly. Uh, we do have a, a Q&A section, and I see that there's also uh, the chat section here. So if there's any questions that, that come up, you know, please uh, let us know. You know, we're going to keep an eye on that, but I will note there's going to be a lot that we have to cover this morning. And so if we're not able to get to the questions, uh, then one of the things we decided to do is we will do a separate uh, live video post answering uh, those questions later. And that way we make sure that all of your questions uh, are addressed. There's also gonna be some things that we're sharing from a screen share perspective. We would just wanna get as much of this information uh, out as possible. Uh, to start up, one of the things that, that I wanted to share really quickly is, you know, over the past couple of weeks, I've been uh, talking about this book, Shift right, how top producers tackle tough times. And when we talk about what's going on in the mortgage forbearance industry, um, you know, there's two tactics that really stuck out to me. Number one is tactic number four, which is find the motivated lead generation. And uh, it starts with a quote that says, if your ship doesn't come in, swim out to it. If your ship doesn't come in, swim out to, to it by Jonathan Winters. And I think that's really important uh, as we look at, you know, what's going on in the industry right now is, hey, we know transactions, especially in LA County, uh, transactions are down about 41%, right? On a week over week basis from that pre-COVID period. And yet we know that it's about really figuring out who are the motivated individuals right now. And more so than just finding the motivated, it's about who out there needs our help right now right? That's the role uh, that we perform as real estate agents is that we're really here to do our fiduciary duty and, and to help our clients. And the second tactic that really stood out to me after this training is tactic 11, which is master the market of the moment, right? Master the market of the moment. And back when this book was written, uh, we were coming out of, you know, that 2008, 2009 shift in the market. And that market of the moment was the REOs. It was the short sales. It was the foreclosures right? Well, the market of the moment right now, one of them is forbearances. One of them is the forbearances. And it starts and it says the game of life is not so much in holding a good hand, but in playing a poor hand well, right? And, and I, would, I, would, I would say that it's, it's more than that. It's knowing what hand you hold, right? It's knowing what hand you hold. And that's where we wanted to come in and really just give some insight into what's uh, going on out in the market and, and what forbearances are and what this impact is. Uh, I'm really excited to have Rich Rector, uh, who is the owner of our, of our market center, of our office here, uh, and has been through how many shifts, Rich? Uh, this is my third one. <laughs> third shift, right? So, so been through quite a few. Uh, and one of the things that Rich does, he actually coaches and consults uh, hundreds of agents and, and uh, brokerage leaders throughout, you know, the industry here. And I thought, uh, one, you know, he gets the insight of not just what's going on in our local market, but what's happening at a national scale and is able to see that uh, at a really high level. And so I'm excited uh, to have him joining us. And then Luis uh, Mendoza, who is working with Downey uh, here at Downey Capital. Uh, and, and Luis, you know, I wanted to share a little bit, you know, when we talk about this idea of forbearances, I want you guys to have the understanding of what a forbearance is, right? It is right now, uh, homeowners are not able to pay, some homeowners are in a position where they may not be able to make their mortgage payments. And a forbearance is a, a almost a convoluted way of saying, hey, they don't necessarily have to make payments right now. Uh, and yet there's a lot of different outcomes and, and there's a longer term impact that that has. And one of the reasons that I really wanted to have Luis come on and share a little bit is Luis, you know, when we spoke, one, I see the passion that you have right now in helping your clients uh, with their refinances, right? And getting them into a positive position. And it's actually because when we look at this long-term impact of what the forbearance has had, uh, you were on, on the losing end of that hand, right? Back in, in uh, 08, 09, 
Can you share a little bit more about the impact uh, that, that forbearance has had on you personally and why you're so passionate about this right now? Yes, uh, sure thing. So I'm definitely the anti-forbearance guy at the office, all right? Um, and this is because personally I was affected by a forbearance agreement that was really overall, it was really a bad agreement for me to, to enter into. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, back in uh, 2000 and, um, 2005, uh, I was already a homeowner. I had a home in, in Norwalk, which was a small three bedroom, two bath. Um, and uh, in 2005, I, I got married. So I purchased another home. It was a, a small house in Downey with uh, two bedrooms, uh, one bath. So I had uh, two properties. So I was, I was sitting very, uh, very well at the time. Um, and uh, what happened was right around 2007, 2008, uh, some of the uh, people who I was leasing the Norwalk property to, who were actually, are, are actually family members, um, they, uh, they got into a, a little bit of a hard times, you know, with uh, work. Uh, some of them got laid off, couldn't make the mortgage payments. And so I started looking into uh, ways of reducing my overall um, responsibilities and, and, and debts. And one of the uh, things that occurred to me was that maybe I could negotiate with the bank uh, with uh, uh, getting a modification and loan modification. <clears throat> so uh, my first step was to uh, try and ask for that loan modification on that Norwalk property that, that I had. And uh, of course, the bank said, well, you, you're not currently late. So what we can do is put you on a uh, forbearance agreement, which basically ha uh, what it is, is you uh, not making uh, the full payment of the mortgage, but only paying half. And if you do that for six months, we're going to uh, turn around, excuse me one minute. Okay. We're going to turn around and give you a uh, permanent modification. So the forbearance agreement was kind of like the goal between, you know, uh, the modification and uh, me making that arrangement, you know, with the bank. So, so I said to them, okay, well, I, I think I can, I can do that. So for, for six months, I entered into this uh, forbearance agreement where I was only making half of my payment at that Norwalk property. And at the end of those six months, I didn't hear anything uh, from the bank and I kept reaching out and, and no one would ever uh, get back to me. Now, uh, the bank that I was dealing with at the time was um, Washington Mutual, which as you know, disappeared. So um, af after the six months, actually I went about seven or eight months making only those half payments. And then I, got, I, I, I received a, a letter from Chase Bank who had apparently purchased all the mortgages from uh, Washington Mutual and they were not honoring any of those forbearance agreements that they had in place. Um, and essentially what they were trying to get me to pay was the other half of the missed payments that, that uh, I hadn't sent in, plus penalties and fees. So they sent me a bill for $28,000 after seven months of being in, on this uh, forbearance agreement. So I, I hired an attorney because I thought, hey, this is not fair. I have, you know, documentation here that shows I entered into forbearance agreement in good faith with Washington Mutual and Chase doesn't want to honor it. Um, and what happened was the, the attorney tried to get a hold of the people at Chase Bank, showed them the paperwork, and they would have none of it. They said, no, we're going to move forward with a foreclosure. So um, I received the uh, notice of sale um, and uh, within one week, I had to go and tell my family members, sorry guys, I, I need you to move out because the house is being sold at an REO auction. And sure enough, within one week, I had someone knocking on my door saying, hey, this is our property now. You guys have to move out. Uh, the only thing I was able to negotiate for my family members was just the... Uh, um, a couple of hundred dollars for moving expenses, but you have to realize that this was a property that, that I bought back in uh, 2000 
and it was uh, it, it was sitting with with a little bit of equity. So it was a a very hard uh, thing for me to to lose such an investment, and that was the first house I I ever bought, and uh, so it was very hard. Now you know, going back to that time, I thought I knew it all. Uh, you know, in 2005, I already had my uh, real estate license. I was a uh, certified financial planner. So I thought I knew it all. And I thought that by dealing with myself, with the banks, that I was going to come out on top. Well, uh, little did I know, these forbearance agreements can actually be uh, changed or modified. Or if, in, like in my case, if the uh, loan gets sold to another bank, they don't have to honor those forbearance agreements. At least that's, that was in my case. And, but for the most part, that's what happened to a lot of people. As you can remember back then, people were looking to get permanent modifications and those uh, bailouts that the government gave to the banks, they only trickle down in the form of modifications only to a couple of people really that, that I knew. And, and there was a lot of other things happening, like, um, you know, uh, attorneys taking people's money saying, yeah, I'm going to get your modification, then, you know, disappearing. And there was a lot of that. So uh, I was definitely a victim of those forbearance agreements. And I'm starting to see that now. Um, yeah. I'm starting to see that uh, on the news, we're hearing, hey, you know, enter into forbearance agreement if you lost your job and your credit is not going to be impacted. Well, I'm running the credit for people who have decided to refi instead of going with uh, their forbearance, which they had originally uh, already asked for. And I'm seeing forbearance on their credit report. It's not a negative, it's, it's not derogatory, but there's definitely a note under their mortgage that says forbearance agreement. And that is a big obstacle for you to do a, a refi, a cash out, anything you want to do that little note right there is, is definitely going to be um, an obstacle. Most banks, once they see that forbearance thing, they say, oh no, you know, we, we can't do it. They already entered into an agreement with their bank. So that's the reason why I'm totally against forbearance agreements. And I realize there's a lot of people that don't have another option. They lost their jobs. There's no money coming in and that's what they have to do. However, I think, I think that's a, a perfect segue, Luis, right, is that when we talk about, you know, what's going on right now, there's a saying, uh, and it's that one, the banks always win, and yes. two, the banks never lose, right? The banks <laughs> never lose. Uh, and right. so, you know, when we look at some of the stats, and I appreciate you sharing that, and I appreciate you sharing your experience, because that's so, it's, it's what a lot of people don't realize is the impact that this is going to have is huge. And that's what we really yes. want to go into with, with all of you is, is talking a little bit about that conversation. In fact, right now, you know, if you, if you talked to me earlier this week or last week when we originally started talking about, hey, we're going to do this class on forbearances, I shared a statistic uh, that it was 8.16% of mortgages that was up from a, less, a little bit less than 3% at the beginning of April. Right now, we are close to 9%, right? 9% of all active mortgage, mortgage loans are in forbearance in the United States as of this week, according to data from Black Knights McFlashdash, right? But we're also noting that there could be uh, 4.9 million loans in forbearance by the end of the month. They're anticipating, they're anticipating that by the end of June, we could be at close to 10%, right? At the beginning of April, we were a little bit over 2%. A little bit over 2%, right? That's been a huge jump. And that's millions of homeowners that are being uh, put in a really difficult situation right now. And what they don't realize is, is the impact that this has. And so my, my, uh, what I really want to drive home today, what we're going to walk through in terms of the conversation, is that as realtors, part of our fiduciary duty is to protect the equity of our clients. Right. Part of our fiduciary duty is to protect the equity of our clients, whether we sold them a home or we would like to do that in the future. You know, Gary Keller said service before sales, right? Service before sales is something he's been talking about recently. And this is, this is the time where we need to be knowledgeable about what is happening, right? What is happening. We also need to be knowledgeable on how do we guide our clients to make uh, decisions 
that are going to be of the best benefit to them in the long run, right? Uh, and, and how do we find the resources that they need to guide them through that? But also, what do we say? How do we have that conversation with them, right? How do we guide them to what that decision might be? And, and also, you know, in our industry, the nice thing about it is when we help people, when we help people in the long run, we make money, right? When we help somebody change their life by helping them buy a home, we make money. When we help somebody change their life by helping them get out of a bad situation and possibly sell their home, there's, there's opportunity for, for us to grow our business. And that's really what we want to talk about today is how do you do your fiduciary duty to your clients? How do you help them protect your equity and position yourself so that you can gain referrals and gain future transactions and maybe even some transactions now for people that are unfortunately running out of options, right? How do you be a best service? Yeah, a couple of things if I can uh, chime in. Um, you know, guys, we're not saying that forbearance is, is necessarily a bad thing because there's people on this call that are in forbearance. There's people that have jobs that, that are, are doing fine, they're in forbearance. What, what, we're, what we're seeing is that because of the CARES Act, um, a lot of people are, you know, taking advantage of the different things in the CARES Act. This is one of the things that's tied to the CARES Act. So you have a lot of people that are entering in forbearance agreements because they, they say, hey, I can defer my payments, you know, three months, six months, whatever that may be. I'm going to take advantage of that, even if they still have their jobs and cash flow. So it's really about being a consultant to them like you always have been, but understanding that they need to understand their contract. They should talk to their CPA, their attorney. They should look at those things like what Luis experienced because nobody knows the future. What we do know and things are changing quickly is you cannot refinance when you're in forbearance. So interest rates are at a 50 year low as you all know and most properties have equity. So if somebody's struggling financially or they may struggle financially, may lose their job in the future not being able to access that equity for cash could be a huge problem for them. I read something yesterday that says that you can't refinance for an entire year at w once you start forbearance. That could be a problem. You can't get access to your equity you know, for, a, for a year from a standpoint of a refinance. So it's, it's helping people understand. I talked to two people this weekend that were just family members and friends over the weekend, and I was blown away that both of them we're in forbearance and they have their jobs and everything's fine with them financially, but they just thought, hey, this is a freebie from the government. And the banks are in a, in a lot of cases are even calling the homeowners and asking them if they want to enter forbearance, which is kind of a scary thing. So it's understanding, you know, the, the, the contract. A lot of these contracts are, they're, they're different. Some of them are balloon payments. Some of them are adding the, the uh, forbearance payments onto the loan. Some of them are, you know, making it up in the months that are, that are right after you're in forbearance, like you'll have double payments. And, there's a, a, and some of them are open-ended where they don't even really know, but we'll go ahead and defer your payments, which is even scarier. So that's the thing is that we have to, to talk to the clients and advise them to, to talk to the people that, that know and to, to review their contract. And really more importantly, ask them, you know, um, what, what are they wanting to accomplish, right? What is it they want to accomplish? Are they needing cash? Um, are, are they, um, is, is maybe the best option for them to sell their home, which is where the listing opportunity comes in, which is one of the reasons we're having this, this webinar today is you know, listings are at an all time low, as we all know. And this is, is a great opportunity if it makes sense for the homeowner to just list their property and sell right now while the market's at the peak Right. And we all know that we're going to have to deal with these economic conditions. So there's going to be a shift and a correction at some point. Who knows when that's going to be, you know, next year, the end of fourth quarter, whatever that looks like. So now you can literally through having a conversation, maybe consult the homeowner to sell now, save their credit, have their cash, go, uh, you know, and sit on the sidelines right now, rent somewhere and wait for the market to correct. And now all of a sudden buy that same house for less when their financial situation is better 
versus being in forbearance, having this snowball, they can't afford their payment, they can't afford their balloon, now they're gonna go into a foreclosure at some point, their credit's wrecked, and now they can't buy a house for so many years, right? And that's the, that's the scary thing is that right at the beginning of this whole crisis, there's people that, um, that are going under forbearance that probably shouldn't, and, and, and some people that are going into forbearance that are going to put themselves in a bad credit situation and possibly lose their home uh, for, for quite some time. So that's, that's the main thing we want to communicate. And if you have those conversations, out of those, those 10% or 4 million plus people that are in forbearance right now, and that number is going to continue to grow, there's a lot of people that will list their home if they understood this is the better option for them. And that's where we can help. And, and that's a perfect uh, segue into, I'm gonna pop a mind map uh, up onto the screen. So can everybody see this? Awesome. Okay, so, so one of the things on this is that, you know, I don't want you to get overwhelmed. We're gonna zoom in on this, is we're sharing a lot of information, right? We're sharing a lot of information. And so what this is designed for is to help you make sense of that information and drive that conversation and really know what the options are for your clients. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this and we're going to start off um, with your client right now. Now, here's the thing is the idea here is that you have the power to really build a database around this and have communication on this. So the first piece that we're going to go over is what are the options that they might have in different scenarios and what are some of the things that you should know about? I will note, you are not a financial advisor, you're a real estate consultant, right? So you also, there's certain points in certain areas where you wanna make sure that they're looping in their financial advisor, that they're looping in at their attorney if needed when we talk a little bit more on the foreclosures and bankruptcy section, right? But we wanna make sure one, that you have uh, the right understanding of what's happening right now and what are the different things that are going on. And we'll also even talk about, you know, what might be a good situation that somebody's in if they're in the forbearance. Right. And then the second piece that we'll go over is a little bit more about how to guide someone through that conversation, how to have that call with them, right? What to talk about and what to say, how to be that resource with them and guide them to end goal, either being that you're able to, you know, they're in a good situation or maybe they need to sell. And now it's that section of getting that listing appointment and consulting to appointment. So I'm going to zoom in right now. We're looking at the right now period and we're going to go into, um, let me get this zoomed in. Technology happens, right guys? So I'm gonna zoom in here really quick. So the first thing that we wanna look at is if they're employed. If they're employed, what are the options that they have whether they're, whether they're employed. So right now, you know, we're making calls to our database, we're having these care conversations with them. And this might be, hey, you know, I wanted to see how's, how's working from home going? How's working from home going? You know, and that really easily, especially if we already have some type of rapport with that person, if there's somebody that we know, then that conversation is gonna open up to, you know, it's, it's going really well, you know, I'm enjoying working from home or here's the challenges we're having with the kids. Right. It could be a conversation that says, hey, you know, unfortunately, we got furloughed, in which case we know to take them the other direction. And then the secondary question around this might be, you know, how are things going financially? Are you in a good situation? Now, you have to have rapport with this. And I want to note that not all of this conversation is going to happen at once. Right. It may be a series of conversations. But what we want to get to is if they are employed and they need um, they need additional information there's two areas that they might need here, right? They may be in a situation where they could potentially cash out refinance reserves, right? Where they could potentially, uh, if they need cash quickly because they're employed, but the expenses have gone up or they're employed and something's going on, right? They may need a refinance. And this is if they haven't got into forbearance already, they may need financial counsel on expenses and negotiating with creditors. There are so many people out there that don't realize that they can negotiate with their cable company, that they can negotiate with, with their credit card companies. All of these different ways that they might be able to kind of decrease their expenses, 
before they jump into, hey, here's, here's the other option I have on forbearance, right? And so we wanna give them some of that information. Um, we've gone over this really in depth in the shifts class, right? When we talk about going through your finances. And so that's something that, you know, we as, as agents should be doing for ourselves, but that's also an opportunity we have to add value to, to our clients, to our database. And then if they are in forbearance or they're considering a forbearance, if they're employed, this is the opportunity we have to potentially get to them before. Now, if they're in forbearance, there's generally about four different uh, repayment terms that we're seeing, right? I'm not saying that this is the be all end all. I'm saying that these are kind of the options that there are right now, right? On the better side of it, which is this one here and it kind of ends here, is deferred payments tacked on the end of the loan. So what does that mean? Someone has a 30 year mortgage, right? They get those payments that are deferred now, they're still accruing interest, right? But they get those payments tacked on to the end of the loan, right? So they're not having to pay it immediately. You've got deferred payments spread out over a period of payments. I couldn't pay for three months. And now instead of paying you know, my, my base payment over the next six months after this, I'm gonna pay a higher amount or whatever that term might be, but that's a deferred payment spread out over a period of payments. Those are probably your best case scenarios, right? Those are probably gonna be the best case scenarios. And that's notwithstanding if for some reason, those terms change at any point, or there's any uh, openness for, for that, that loan to be sold, or those different things that could potentially happen. The best case scenario, we have these two, two options, right? And worst case scenario, we've got no repayment terms at all. We'll figure it out later. I've seen that a lot. In fact, uh, so in my family, I started reviewing some forbearance agreements that were sent to my family. Uh, and we, we have uh, portfolio income properties and no payment terms. We'll figure it out later was something that came up. Right. And it was, uh, and, and I said the universal rule at the beginning when we were talking to Louise, is two things. The bank never loses and the bank always wins. The bank never loses and the bank always wins. So new, no repayment terms at all. We'll figure it out later. Unfortunately, the consumer is on the losing end of that, right? Is we don't know what that's gonna be. That's like saying, hey, you know, let me give you my, it's, it's like putting your money into an account and not knowing what this is gonna look like at the tail end of that. Right, and not knowing what's gonna go on three months from now, six months from now, not knowing if they're gonna say, hey, you know, we're, we're playing the lottery here, and they're saying, oh, good case, you know, deferred payments tacked on at the end, bad case, doing full, right, doing full. So that's, that's uh, option number three. Option number four is deferred payments doing full at the end of forbearance. Now, I don't know about you guys, right now, but we've got so many people that are unfortunately experiencing uh, unemployment, right? That unfortunately are in these tough situations. And that's one of the reasons that they're looking at this as a potential option. Right? That's one of the reasons they're looking at forbearance is because maybe they can't make their payments or they're not educated about, you know, what the consequences might be if they could. But if they're in a situation where, where they're employed even, Right, and yet the deferred payments are due in full at the end of the forbearance. It's very difficult to now come up with a balloon payment three months later, six months later. Mm -hmm. Right, and now we have a really rough situation. You know, and, and Rich said something on this where it was, you know, we've been hearing a lot about this idea that that if you, you know, go into forbearance, that you're at the losing end of being able to refinance for a year after. Right, that actually came out in Crane Chicago Business. They talked about that. Right, uh, there was an article that came out on uh, earlier earlier this this month, and it said it could be as much as as twelve months after that. Not only can you not refinance, but you can't rebuy if you went into forbearance. You can't get a new loan. Yep. Right. On, uh, on a quick, uh, quick other note, um, I was yeah. talking to a client last week, and I think they were in New Jersey, and their top agent was um, had two transactions that blew out because the people that were buying 
one of his listings were forbearance on the home that they were selling. And, and it's not because they were in financial hardship. It's because they thought that they could, you know, defer payments because of the CARES Act. And, and all of a sudden, the, the lender to fund the loan on the purchase said, wait a second, forbearance means you're not making payments. So you're not qualified for a loan now. That's a problem. And all of a sudden, this, this agent had two deals that, that blew out. And I'm hearing that over and over and over again. So this goes beyond, is there an opportunity to, to get to take more listings? It's, it's, it's really, you know, we need to take a look at our pipeline. We need to take a look at, you know, the, the buyers we're working with. And we need, to, we need to start asking this question, you know, do they have questions on, on mortgage forbearance? Have they been hearing about it? Because when you have the, the banks that are calling the homeowners and this stuff's all over the news, you know, people are seeking out forbearance even if they don't have hardship. And that's where this could really bottleneck and create a problem for some transactions as well as an opportunity. So I just wanted to point that out. Absolutely. That's huge, right? So again, if they're employed, two options if you catch them before they go into forbearance right this is why we have the conversation and they need to cash out funds if they're sitting on equity they could potentially do a, a cash out refinance right uh, you can provide them with some counsel on making sure they're managing their expenses if they are already in forbearance that if they are already in forbearance or if they're considering forbearance then this is the opportunity that we have to kind of coach and consult them on understanding the four different uh, options that, that it comes down to when we look at repayment terms, right? When we look at the repayment terms, right? Now, deferred payments tacked on into the loan, okay, good case scenario. Deferred payments spread out, okay, good case scenario. Now, if they are in forbearance, what are the options that they have? Or if they're considering forbearance, what are the options that they have when it comes from repayment? Now, as they're preparing for repayment, there's a couple pieces here. Reserves from refinance is really not gonna happen. Unless they already cashed out before, they're not gonna have the opportunity to refi while they are in forbearance, right? Now, if they have savings, sure, they could, they could cash in their savings and uh, repay these balloon payments. And yet in reality, what happens when the money's in the account and they didn't pay it out, right? We wanna consult them to, to pay their mortgage on time, not put themselves in a, in a forbearance situation and, and, and uh, not necessarily have to cash in on their savings, right? Retirement funds. Now, one of the things that came up as we've been going through uh, this pandemic was that there's no penalty right now on cashing out your 401k or accessing your 401k if needed, right? There's certain things around that. Uh, and again, they need to talk to a financial advisor around that. But here's the thing is that if you've got someone who has equity in a home and they have some type of retirement account and that retirement account has been accruing interest and now all of a sudden they're pulling out that money to put it into this particular property, not only are they damaging their, their, uh, that immediate bulk sum that was in the retirement account, they're affecting the future interest they could have earned on that and they're affecting their livelihood however many years from now, right? Because of compound interest. So there's a lot that comes into play when they access their retirement funds. And that's something they definitely need to speak with, with a financial advisor around, which is really important. And it might not be the best option, right? It just might not be the best option for them, right? Now. And Monica, uh, if, if I can add something to that, um, the uh, government right now is allowing you to tap into your 401k, 457 account, you know, uh, without that 10% penalty. However, you still have to pay taxes. So when you withdraw the money, a, a third of it is still going to uh, be going to, you know, to, to pay for your taxes. So uh, people are not going to be able to access their entire uh, savings on a 401k or 457 account. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll amend my statement earlier. The banks always win. The banks never lose. The IRS also always wins and the IRS never loses. That's right. The IRS also always wins and never loses, right? Yeah. So if, we're, if they're in this situation, what we want to get to is we really want to ask the question, are, have they been thinking about selling in the next three to five years? Was that a conversation 
that, that they've had. And now that they're looking at this forbearance option, what is the, what is the option? What is the opportunity they may have right now? Right. And the thing is, is if they're looking at selling, if they were considering selling in the next three to five years, what do we know to be true? We know right now inventory is tight. We know right now prices are still stable, right? We know inventory is tight. Prices are still stable, right? We know that there's still demand with buyers out there and the demand that's out there uh, has been bottlenecked. So we're seeing that pick up. We're still in multiple offer situations. And we know that we anticipate some type of price correction, right? This, this forbearance market is unfortunately, there will be people that lose their homes. Unfortunately, that's gonna happen. And it's either gonna be that they sell or they get in a tough situation and the bank forecloses. And we're gonna talk about that on the other side of this, right? But in that case, right, right, if they're planning on potentially selling in three to five years, then the best opportunity might be to sell right now, right? When the market is still high, when they still have equity, right? When they need to, instead of the next three to five years, bank the proceeds, potentially rent or downsize, right? Into something smaller or something more manageable and buy back at a reduced price later, right? Take advantage of the market when we do experience the price correction, right? And so there's a couple options and this is where it really gets to thinking ahead and thinking uh, a little bit more like an investor. What do investors do? We buy when the market is low, right? We buy when the market is low. And so this is the opportunity for, for you know, and, and we end it here, right? Is if they're in a good situation, if that's not something they're considering, that's okay. But if they're in a rough situation, if they're in a situation where they're looking at these repayment options and they're realizing like, hey, I might, might not be able to manage this, then what is the option they have right now? to potentially sell, right? It's to potentially sell. I was reading uh, today uh, the, a publication from, um, from Black Knight uh, as well. It's a, the publication that you had quoted. Um, and they said that, that right now in inactive foreclosure, which is not forbearance, inactive people that were being foreclosed on that now stop because of the whole crisis and, and so on, moratoriums, that it's the highest since 2015. So in five years, so that, so that's, so you can see these, besides this forbearance thing, we are already starting to, we were st before the crisis start to, to have um, building in the, in the foreclosure arena, just like we had in 2008. So this is real, right? And, and like she said, you know, the forbearance, there's going to be a lot of people that, that um, are doing this because they have to, um, and they're buying time and, you know, unfortunately, since the banks don't lose, there's going to be at some point where they're not going to be able to be able to make their payment or make up their payments or, or those types of things. And the, the better job that we can do at getting in front of this to just having the conversation, um, we're not attorneys, right? So we want to give legal advice, but we want to have the conversation to see what's best for them and their family. You, you honestly could, could really save them. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Right, absolutely. And as you're calling through, you're gonna find some people that are on the other side of this, right? Those that are unemployed, right? Those that are unemployed. And so this conversation gets a little bit deeper. Right? This conversation is gonna get a little bit deeper. Uh, again, same thing, you know, you get somebody that they're in an unemployed situation. We wanna find out, are they in forbearance already? Or are they not in forbearance, right? Because if they have equity, then there might be options for cash out refinance, right? And getting some cash out if they need it initially. Uh, and if not, then if they're in forbearance, now again, we wanna have an understanding of the forbearance agreement, four options we talked about, and then preparing for repayment. Now, we get a little deeper here in terms of some of the options that are available when it comes into preparing for repayment, right? It could be a personal loan, right? A personal loan, talking with family and friends to see who might be able to help them, right? And yet we know that a lot of people are in a rough situation. A lot of people are in a rough situation right now. And so that might not necessarily uh, be the, an option that's available to them, right? Reserves and savings that we already talked about, uh, retirement funds again, 
right, that we talked about and that that might not be the best option. It might be the only option, right, uh, in the repayment if we're not looking at the selling option and we're going to talk about that, right, and then bankruptcy. And this is where you definitely need to have them speak with an attorney because there is, uh, m many states have what's called a, a homestead protection for primary residents, right? If it's their primary residence, then they may have the opportunity to stay in the home regardless if they um, had bankruptcy. That's gonna be something where you wanna loop in uh, their attorney and have, to have them talk to their attorney about that, right? But that might be an option that's available to them uh, from a repayment perspective. And yet in reality, in reality, somebody that's getting into a situation of forbearance agreement, right, uh, and, and is in a position where, unfortunately, uh, they, they are unemployed and are not anticipating any employment coming soon or, or they're not sure what this is going to look like, well, they might not have the option to refinance because there's no income, right? So that that option may be taken off the table. And so in reality, the option may come down to selling. And when they're selling, there's two positions they could be in, an equity position or a no equity position, right? And so we're gonna talk about the equity position first, right? We're gonna talk about the equity position first. Uh, we have the good scenario, and then we have the, the not so great scenario, right? Is, is there's really two options here, and this is why it's so important to get to them at the beginning of this, is that if they're in an equity position and they choose to sell before going into default, right? And right now we know, you know, there's there's uh, certain moratoriums in place, and yet we're we're it's good. It doesn't mean that they're not, you know, there's not an impact of of missing those payments, right? So selling before going into default, banking the proceeds to preserve their credit. Uh, renting until the market dips or downsizing if they have that opportunity, right? They may need uh, additional resources to be able to do that, like potentially buying cash if they have enough equity uh, or having some type of co-signer if they're unemployed and then buying back in at a reduced rate. So fairly the same option that we had on the other side, right? If they're in an equity position and they do end up going into any type of foreclosure later, right? Now foreclosure sale, again, Public sale generally set for the bank's benefit. Bank always wins, bank never loses, right? They set the sales price. Investors tend to buy at closure sales. We saw that happen a lot back in uh, 08, 09. I know because I was out there, you know, going to home auctions and, and investing at that time and investors always buy at a reduced rate, right? Always at a discount. The bank is made whole on their debt. The bank is made whole, but the owner, your client, Right, the people that you're here to help, they get whatever's left. Right? And they get drastically reduced price proceeds. Their credit can be destroyed. They may have to rent for three to five years while they're re rebuilding their credit. And maybe three to five years from now, once they've rebuilt their credit, now buy back in. Right now, buy back in. Right? But it's a rough situation to be in. Uh, so in reality, the best situation here, if they're in an equity position and are unemployed, they need to cash out, then selling before going into default, right? And that's the conversation we wanna have. Now, if they don't have equity, things get a little bit uh, deeper, right? We have an additional option that's added here. So again, selling before going into default, right? We get, we get all of that piece that's still here. The foreclosure sale is gonna be uh, pretty similar here. There's gonna be a caveat on this foreclosure sale, right, on no equity, is if they don't have equity, if they get foreclosed on, and they have to sell, there's something called a deficiency, right? There's something called a deficiency. Now, a deficiency means the property is worth 500, or the debt on the property is, let's say it's 400, right? The property sells for 300. There is a 100K deficiency. That's what happens in short sale, right? Deficiency, uh, there's a deficiency. Now, the bank, the financial institution, now has the option to say, I forgive the deficiency, I don't forgive the deficiency, which means your client still owes that 100K that they'll have to pay in their lifetime because the bank always wins, the bank never loses, right? So the deficiency judgment is a judgment that is put against them to say, hey, we're coming to collect, right? We're coming to collect. 
they go into bankruptcy, destroyed credit, rent, maybe three to five years from now. And once they've paid that deficiency, they can buy back in, right? Now we get into the short sale. Short sale, two options, deficiency not forgiven. So for those of you that have uh, been through the short sale market before, right, or have worked the short sale market, the goal was always that if we're, we're representing our client in a short sale, uh, short sale, that we are negotiating deficiency forgive, forgiveness as part of that short sale agreement, right? But what a short sale is, is that we're not getting foreclosed on, right? But we are, we are negotiating that the bank will accept uh, or allow us to sell the property for less than the debt that is due on it, right? For less than the debt that is due on it. And in that case, they have deficiency not forgiven, deficiency judgment, right? Bankruptcy, destroyed credit, right back in. Now, if the deficiency is forgiven, what happens? Well, that forgiven debt is counted as earned income. It's like seller proceeds, right? Except they don't actually see the money. There's no, they're not getting any money, but they're counting it as earned income. They need to speak with an accountant around this because it can become a tax problem. There's tax implications that comes with seller proceeds, right? All of a sudden, they're getting a reported 100K in seller proceeds of, as forgiven debt that they don't actually have, so they don't have the money to pay the taxes on the money that they don't have, right? So it becomes a tax problem. Uh, those taxes cannot be included in bankruptcy because what did I say? Not only does the bank always win, the IRS always wins, right? So we'll now, and this becomes a broader conversation because can there be mortgage debt forgiveness? We don't know, but we know that that requires congressional action, right? So as of right now, no. Will that change? I don't have a crystal ball to know, but it is an option. So we put it on here. Um, if passed, then that could potentially be a, a release of former uh, of the tax debt, right? If passed, if not, they still have that tax debt. They have destroyed credit, rent for three to five years, rebuilds credit, buy back it. Okay. So irregardless of what situation they're in, what I really want to drive home with this, what I really want to drive home with this is that what are the options, right? Is that this is about being a consultant because there's a variety of conversations that you can take them through here, right? There's a variety of conversations that you can take them through here and you wanna you know, go through this, kind of study this, uh, we'll make sure that you get the recording as well because you wanna have a little bit more insight and you don't wanna do this alone, right? And what I mean by that is you need to know that hey, financial, they need to talk to their accountant, right? Or if you have someone to recommend to them, they need to talk to, if they're looking at bankruptcy or anything around that, they need to speak with an attorney around those pieces as well. Or if they're looking at the homestead protection, right? Any of those pieces, they need to speak with an attorney. We are not financial advisors. We are real estate consultants guiding them through this conversation, right? Guiding them through this conversation. So what does this look like in a conversation? Now we know what all the different options are on the table. What does this look like in a conversation? Let me uh, get to our, there we go. Okay, so let's get to a little bit more of that, that conversation piece on here. And so we could see a little bit of this. So this is as we get into the actual conversation. This is a guide through that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna note guys, this is not one conversation, right? Because if, oh, sorry guys, let me, tech happens everyone. Um, there we go, okay. Everybody can see that, the script for decision points? Okay, perfect. So this is not one conversation because if you try to have this entire conversation, all the information we just shared with you in one conversation, I'm sorry guys, your client's gonna run for the hills, right? They may not be prepared for that. This is a really in-depth conversation. If they're in a rough situation, they're, they're emotional right? There's a lot of emotion that's attached to this. You have people that, that their, their partner might not even know that they're in forbearance or that they haven't paid the mortgage, right? We saw that happen a lot in 08, 09. I guarantee you that it's happening right now. I hear about it all the time, right? Is you have conversations 
that are not necessarily happening in the home because one partner is trying to solve you know the problems and and unfortunately they haven't worked through this and i'll note you guys this is a really um you need to establish rapport with the client right you need to establish rapport with the client you kind of start the conversation and this is going to be uh with the ultimate goal being that you guide them through this process but they need you right now they need you right now right hey, Monica, More, um, yeah absolutely real, real quick um i have a client right now that didn't know he had just entered in for into a forbearance agreement because his wife uh, called the bank just to ask about it and they automatically entered their property into forbearance. So apparently it doesn't even require signatures from people. You just call the bank, they say, yeah, we're gonna put you in this forbearance agreement right now, don't worry about it. And then they go into it. Um, luckily for them, we're doing a cash out refi and the forbearance is not yet showing on, on their credit reports, but it's, that's how easy people are getting into forbearance right now. They just call the bank to ask and boom, automatically they're into a forbearance agreement. Wow. And that's, uh, I'll know uh, the bank called my brother and asked him if he wanted to go into forbearance. That's scary, right? That's scary. Thankfully he knows a, a, a somebody in real estate, right? That can consult him on that and, and call to ask, but that's a scary situation to be in. So going down what this conversation looks like, I would have this printed out in front of me, right? Both of these, I actually have both of them printed out in front of me, right? Because this is how we really guide through our conversation. But we wanna have a care call. It's a care call. It's the easiest call, at least to start, right? It's the, hey, how are you doing? How are things going? It's, if it's a past client, you know, it's your realtor, I sold you that home over on Eucalyptus, and I just wanted to call and see how things are going. Here's, we wanna find out certain things, right? We want to find out certain things. This reveals their, their employment status. How is it going working from home? Right? How is it going working from home? Because what's going to happen? Oh, you know, uh, it's going really well. Oh, it's really tough. Oh, you know what? That's a sensitive question. I've been furloughed, right? I was laid off. You know, I'm not working from home, right? We want to get to, are they employed or unemployed? That's what we're trying to get. So we know what conversation to guide them down. Right now, revealing the level of in intimacy, right? I have a lot of clients that are worried about the next several months and what they're going to do from a financial perspective, right? What they're going to do from a financial perspective and, and asking a lot of questions about, you know, these mortgage forbearances, and everything that's been going on. I have a lot of clients worried about the next several months that's designed a particular way. I have a lot of clients so that they have that, that um, certainty that they're not the only one. They're not unique because there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of shame right now, right? There's a lot of shame and, and that's not to say that they, they should feel that way. It's just that's how people feel a lot of times when they're talking about money and they're in a tough situation. As they feel that shame, they feel that guilt, right? So we want to open it up and we want to be really sensitive to that is I have a lot of clients working, worried about the next several, several months. You know, are you worried? How is that going, right? And this is, you're gonna go two different directions here. So if you are very, uh, very close with that client, if you have a really good relationship with them, then you're gonna go into transparent, like very directly going into coaching with them, right? I'm very concerned about the forbearance agreements I'm seeing. Uh, many folks aren't aware they can renegotiate their bills, right? We go into coaching mode. If you have that level of intimacy with them where they're giving you those open answers, right? But some people will not. So you use third party scripting. That's talking about other people. I had this client and, and so Louise shared, right? I had this client that uh, was, was entered into a forbearance agreement without their knowledge because they called to ask. Did you know that was possible, right? It's now we're talking about clients, someone else, third party, because we see that they're a little bit reluctant and that gives us the opening for them to start opening up a little bit more, right? To start opening up a little bit more. Our goal in this conversation is gonna be three things. We wanna find out, do they have adequate reserves? You know, are you in a position where you'll be okay over the next couple months, you know, to, to really deal with, with everything that's going on? You know, have you, and if they say yes, 
great, right? That's great. You know, I, I'd love to just send you some resources. If they say no, do you have equity, right? Or if they're a past client, well, you may have equity now because I know, you know, we've talked and, uh, and your home is worth X, right? Uh, can they, have they entered a forbearance agreement? We want to know if they've entered a forbearance agreement and we want to know is their employment stable. We are not going into full consulting mode yet, right? We're asking with the goal of this information, right? We're asking with the goal of this information. Um, and, and I see some of the questions in, we're, we're going to answer a lot of these questions uh, separately, but I, but I also want to make sure I know we're running out of time. <laughs> so I want to make sure that we wrap up uh, with a couple of the pieces here. So you set up the next call, right? Again, not one conversation. We set up the next call with homework. If they need to get equity, if they, if they have equity and they need to get cash out reserves, looking into a refi having them call their creditors and negotiating their interest, right? On just regular credit cards, send me your forbearance agreement. If they are in forbearance or are looking at that as an option, I will review it for you because we wanna find out which of the four outcomes they're being given, right? Next call, what is the goal? Explain the forbearance agreement, discuss their repayment options and plant the seed to sell if appropriate and again, find out is their employment stable, right? Is their employment stable? We set up a next call, right? A next call with homework. Speak with a financial planner. So if they're looking at, if they're saying, hey, my, report, my repayment options, I can access my 401k, I can do this, that, or the other, speak with a financial planner if we're drawing retirement funds and exploring other options for liquidity, including possibly selling, right? Our next call, the goal is establish a repayment plan strategy, which we run over. Review the national forbearance numbers with them. Position yourself as the expert. Review the value of the home and equity position. Is selling an option here because they have a certain amount of equity? And find out if there's any change in their employment stability. That changes regularly. Companies are still furloughing people, right? And then you're going to set up the next call with homework. Determine how long they would stay in the house if there was no COVID. Some people are not gonna leave, right? Are not ready to leave the home. Speak with an attorney if appropriate, speak with a CPA if appropriate, with our goal being now either we've, either we've helped them into a great situation and we're gonna find a way to get referrals from it or we've set ourselves up for the listing appointment. We've set ourselves up for the listing appointment. If as we've guided them through this funnel, the option is to sell, then we've set ourselves up for that appointment. What I, one of the things I'd just add, I know we're, we're at the end here and, um, and I'll let you know, people are asking how they can get copies of this and, and obviously we can, we can handle that. Remember this whole thing um, is about being serving your your database your clients the people you know and you love in your community um, by having conversations so start with the care call start with how are you doing is there anything that you need right um, where you're we're talking about what's happening which is obviously the the virus and all that stuff I mean is there anything that you need that we can help you with how are you doing and then how's it going you know working from home and you're getting into conversation so come from care and and that of service and then ask them you know do you have any questions on you know on on refinancing on mortgage forbearance on real estate and anything at all during these you know challenging times or these these you know different times and and that's going to lead you into these conversations and, and and go from there so remember come from care and service first and, and there may be an opportunity um, or there may not um, from a standpoint down the road or in the future. But the one opportunity that you're going you're gonna to create is the opportunity for them by understanding and looking at, 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 at this you know, full circle so they know what options they have to save their credit, to save their equity, to stay in their home, you know, or to make the right move strategically because they have all the facts. So that's really what we want to accomplish, guys. 
And, and, and you as the consultant, you're going to be their realtor for life because you're helping them think through things that they probably weren't thinking about because the bank just called them and said, hey, you want to do this? And they didn't read any of the fine print or even haven't even gotten any of the fine print, right? So yeah. I'll, I'll know everybody. I mean, this, you know, I said the banks always win. The bank never loses. The IRS always wins. The IRS never loses. We want your clients to win. We want you to win right? And this is how you do it. Your clients need you. They need you more than they've ever needed you before. Uh, they need you to guide them through these conversations. And by not, I know, you know, everybody gets that call reluctance to call your database. Right now, if you do not call your clients, if you do not call your clients, you're hurting them because they need this information. They need your help, right? They need your help. And so uh, I really just want to drive that home, that, that point home, part of the reason that, and, and I know there's some questions about how to get that presentation. Um, we'll share it in the hub and then definitely, you know, you can email me at, at Monica at Monica uh, Rivera.com, right? I'm more than happy to, to connect with you around this and we'll also share it in the hub. Uh, but I know we have a lot of guests on the call, so please send me an email. Uh, and for the, for those that are with us, uh, we'll post that in the hub as well for you. Uh, and then, you know, with that, on that point, where he said, hey, we want you to win. We want your clients to win. There's a quote that was shared with me that I absolutely love. It said, history is written by the victors. History is written by the victors. And I'll share, you know, I'm not nervous about what history is going to write about us and about you should you choose to take advantage of this and really help your clients because we intend to write it. We intend to write it. That's so right. Author, win the day. Be your client superhero like these guys in my background. If you save their uh, house and their equity, you're going to be their superhero. You're going to have a client for life. Absolutely. Absolutely. You guys all have a phenomenal day, uh, and, and we will see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.